recording? Yeah. All right, here we go. Hello, everybody. Um, Sean Devine. Um, this is our fifth Q and A. It's been a, a lot of fun. Um, for those of you that haven't been here, Daryl Umber and I from DollyGroupie.net, who I've known for about 15, 16 years, maybe longer. I don't know. We met in Shreveport actually on a job. We were on different jobs, but um, decided to do this purely out of boredom. Um, <laughs> I'm hoping that we'll all be back to work soon and these will no longer become necessary. Um, but it's been fun. And this week we have Brad Ray and Peter Rosenfeld. Brad, um, you know, anybody who's a dollar grip knows who Brad is. Um, and I've never worked with Brad. I've never worked on a job with Peter, but they've worked together on many jobs. I actually got a call for a movie a few years ago from um, Jimmy Sweet about a, a, a movie and asked if I wanted to push Dolly. And he said the only caveat would be is if the operator wanted his own Dolly grip. And the very next day he calls back and goes, the operator wants his own dolly grip. And it was Peter and Brad. Oh, and, Jesus, you know, I knew you were going to go there. I just <laughs> knew it. They did you know, mention, the they did point of me bringing that up Jimmy. is that I fully respect that. You know, like there's a few guys that want me. And, you know, it's it's part of the deal. Like it, it's not hurt feelings. It's It's about being comfortable with who you want. And I fully respect that. And when I asked Brad to do this, and um, who he wanted, he, he chose you because you've done so many jobs together and because of the rapport and the camaraderie and the friendship you've developed. And that's exactly the point of all of this, in my mind, is, is talking about that. And that's what we're here today to find out and learn about is what makes the two of you work together. And um, I, with that, I'm gonna leave it to, to Daryl, but I appreciate everybody coming and I appreciate both of you agreeing to be here today. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks for setting it up. They they did it to me too, Sean. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. You're like a tornado in the too, film well. industry. <laughs> oh, it's been done to all of us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I had a great I had a great time with you guys. I had a fun. Um all right, Peter and uh Brad. Welcome, first of all, welcome everybody from Thank you. wherever you're from you, all over the world. Um, um Peter Rosenfeld and Brad Ray. Um, they've worked together a lot, and um, uh, I got some some of their credits here. Gone Girl, Ant-Man and the Wasp, Memoirs of a Geisha, and then, of course, separately, Peter's done American Sniper, Bright, X-Men Origins, Wolver uh, Wolverine, John Q, and Brad did the uh, highly expected Top Gun Maverick, A Little Princess, Angels and Demons, and A Few Good Men, and the list goes on and on. Um, and uh, I was actually, uh, I did, uh, B, I ended up doing B camera on that job um, with, with Peter and Brad. And I remember um, Brad said something one time and, uh, or, or uh, Peter said something about Thelma, Thelma and Louise and Brad went, uh, hey, Peter, like that. He said, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> he said, your resume is unbelievable. <laughs> and Peter looked at me and said, have you seen his resume? I said, yes, we've all seen his resume. Um, but what I wanted to get into today, we had a really good time last week with uh, Mango and um, Mitch Dubin. And, um, and you can tell by uh, uh, two, two other people who have worked together a lot. Um, and you can tell by talking to them they, that they, they have a lot of fun on set. They laugh, they, they, um, they get along really well, and they, they, you know, they know when it's time to work and when it's time not to. Um, how important, uh, Brad or Peter, how important is it to laugh? while you're at work oh my god Go ahead, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, i mean there's so much unnecessary stress in this business you guys all know it and uh i i say this you know if i end up working with a focus puller i've never worked with before i never have to say this to brad because he knows it but if I, I usually say on the first time i meet them i say if we don't have a good hearty laugh at least once a day something's terribly wrong because <laughs> This is our lives, you know what I mean? This is how, where we spend our lives, you know? We are with these people, I'm with Brad often more than I'm with my family. So, so if we can't enjoy it and relax and, 
you know, and as you point out, you know, you do your job and you know when it's time to, to put the gloves on and get serious, but to just enjoy it and laugh every now and then, absolutely, Ab absolutely. And you can see that Mango and Mitch have that, you know, going and that, it yeah. makes the day go well and it cuts the stress. And you know what, if it's done respectfully, I think it's good for the actors too, because if the dolly grip and the camera operator are having a laugh or, you know, enjoying their time there, then that energy kind of pushes out from the camera and, and feel it. They feel safe there. You know, many, a lot of what we have to do is make the actors feel safe. We're in the performance capture business and they have to feel protected and safe from us, you know, from, not from us, but yeah. Bob, yeah. so that we're there to support them. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, you know, it's, it's a job. It's a tough job. Sometimes it's tougher than other times. You know, sometimes it's a little stressful. You're kind of under the gun and stuff. But by and large, in, you know, when it's all said and done, you're making a movie. So it's like, you know, you're making a movie. You're having a good time. If you can't have fun and laugh and, you know, have a little, have some good time, then it's just like, it would be hateful. It would be horrible just to show up every day and, you know, yeah, go through the ringer. Yeah. Um, and this kind of goes along with something that I've been asked o over the years a lot about. Uh, we talk a lot about technical stuff and, and you know, what brand of spray we use on our track and crap like that. Um, but I get asked sometimes about how, especially as a dolly grip, how, how you carry yourself on set. You know what I mean? Um, can you give us some tips? About that? Um, well, you know, I might not be the poster child for that, but um, by and large, nice belly. By and large, uh, <laughs> the funny thing is, is, you know, you're you're dolly grip. You're in the grip department, but a lot of times on set, you're kind of like the the first person that somebody walks on set and doesn't really know what's going on. Kind of comes in contact with as a part of the grip department. Key grips off, running around doing his thing. He might not be there, but you're always standing by camera. And whenever anybody shows up on set, the first thing they want to do is they want to look at the camera. So you know, everybody gravitates toward the camera, and then you happen to be standing there, uh, hopefully, and uh, so you're the first grip department that anybody really comes in contact with. So, you know, you should act professional, sort of. You should, you know, um, I'm, I'm an older guy, so, uh, you know, I'm more long pants and, and boots and that kind of stuff. But, you know, just uh, try not to be too loud. I mean, there's, you kind of get a feel for the set and you get a feel for what's going on. So you kind of know when you can, kind of act the fool and other times when you get kind of like you know, you know play it straight so you know just uh, be yourself and uh, try and act professional try and act professional i do sometimes sometimes not so much but so hmm. long-winded yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's a great answer um i'm suddenly aware after i watched last week's i'm also suddenly aware of how uh nobody told me i had a southern accent now that's all i hear <laughs> i didn't hear it before <laughs> but uh anyway um, and th here's another question that I, that I, cause, um, there's, obviously there's always a different answer. And I, I briefly talked to Brad this morning and, um, I was going to kind of, um, since you guys did Gone Girl together and, um, which I know it was a David Fincher picture and we all know how exacting David Fincher is. Um, can you and Peter talk to us about, um, some things that, that you ha might've had to do on a show, on a show with him that you wouldn't have to do with anybody else or you know Brad, I, could, I, could, I could i could i could write a book on that one uh, <laughs> yeah. actually he's been there a few more times than me or yeah. at least or at least the, or at least the hand guide you yeah. know for dolly grips and yeah. and uh, and operators you know when I, I i got the call for gone girl i remember sitting in a restaurant and uh it was jeff cronowitz and um you know, when I finished the previous one, Social Network, I said to myself, okay, I've done one. I don't ever have to do another one of these things. And, um, and, then, and then, of course, when he calls you, you know, he's one of the smartest, Fincher is one of the smartest people I've ever met in my life. He's a tremendous filmmaker. But it, he places really high bars for various departments, well, all departments, really, but particularly for uh, the dolly grip, the camera operator, and the set dresser. I would say those three positions are most likely to get fired on a, on a Fincher movie. So that's the top three. And the first thing I, I, I told Jeff, I'd call him back. I, I, the next thing I did literally is call Brad because 
if I can't do it with Brad, then I'm out there not knowing. Literally, Fincher's so exacting that if you're off by, you know, four or five scan lines on your frame, maybe, you know, two inches on the dolly track, he'll say cut. He won't just run the take. He's going to say cut. And he's going to go, uh, Brad, Peter, that's not your mark. And he'll be right. So the the standard is very high and the and the and the and the pressure is very high but i have to tell you though guys you know for me and i'm only speaking for myself and my work as a camera operator the movies i did with fincher is the best work of my career and and the reason i say that is because the operating is invisible um the the frame only moves when it's deliberate you, you never see any kind of fishing around, you know, where an actor comes close to the edge of the frame over here. And every camera operator in the world is going to just ease it over. So you don't, you know, you don't do that. On a Fincher movie, he reserves a little bit of the look around, a little bit of the um, image area on the sensor that's not, that he's not going to use for projection. And he reserves that for repositioning the frame. So the operator needs to hold the frame I always say, you know, that what you got to do in a Fincher film, if things start going wrong, is hold your balls really tight and do nothing. Because he will cut. If the actor is right here on the edge of the frame and he's missed his mark, he'll just cut. But if I move over, I ruin it for him because he can't then reposition the frame. So, you know, the rules are very different on movies, on, him, on his movies, but the work and the way he thinks of linear, you know, everything being linear, are the verticals being perfectly straight, I mean, I've never met anyone like it, really. Uh, for me and my taste in cinema, it's the best work of my career. Do you, want, do you have any points of view on that, Brad? Well, um, Peter asked me uh, about another film from David earlier, and I was unavailable, so we couldn't, that didn't work out. So he called for Gone Girl, and I said, yeah, sure, you know. Um, and then, of course, I had never met Jimmy Sweet, and so then I got a hold of Jimmy Sweet, and we worked out, you know, all the Sweet stuff. And um, so... When we showed up, uh, you know, of course, I'd heard all about Fincher and, and all that kind of stuff. And and in the beginning, you know, he's kind of he's kind of uh, outspoken at times, and he can also kind of be hard on people. So there was a little bit of screaming and yelling and foul language, and you're this and what are you that and da da da. And so for me, and a little little bit of it was directed to Peter sometimes because they'd work together, so they have a relationship, and it's just like you know, he'd start reaming them out. So in the beginning, I thought, man, this guy's a real d-bag, you know. So I'm not, I wasn't, I wasn't having a good time, and I was because he was beating up on on a guy here, you know. So I was just kind of like, man, this guy, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to handle this program. And uh, so once I figured out that it was just him and the way, you know, he did it, he didn't reserve it for anybody special. It's just part of the, the drill. So I kind of got over myself, and and then it was just like, okay, here we go. And you know, he. Everything is, like Peter said, everything's linear. You know, you're this way, you're this way. So as far as like doing big crane moves and swinging arms and that kind of stuff, you're not going to get a lot of that. It's all, he doesn't do it. He doesn't do that. No, no. You lay up, you know, he'll give you a mark. Like when Moose was saying earlier, they find something with a finer, boom, you put a piece of tape on the ground, you measure it up, you go over it, and you do the other one. And that's what you get. And you're going from A to B, and you're going to do it, you know, 130 times. But um, so it was like, okay, that, yeah, you know, this is this is cool. I can do this. But the funny thing was, is everything was so like I was telling Daryl this morning. Everything has to be so exact and so precise that Jimmy bought a certain kind of track, and we had all this stuff that was we we did a bunch of uh, camera positions on a car in a parking lot in Missouri, and then we were going to redo it on stage. So we were taking measurements, and it was four degrees down here and eighteen degrees over here, and so we wrote it all down. And then once we got on stage, we busted out the notes and we started, you know, putting the cameras in all these positions and, and he changed. Them. So I was like, okay, I guess those will tear those pages out of the book. And, and so there was a shot in a dining room in, uh, in Doogie Hauser's house. And uh, we, it was behind a table and he, we lived on the peewee because he didn't like the big hybrid. I had a hybrid and two peewees. And so, uh, we were using the Pee Wee 3 Plus. So we, he wanted to skinny it up. So we throw it behind the table, we skinny it up, we go to throw the track down, and I was like, oh, well, this is a nice little, little deal. This track that we have, 
you can't skin it up because the turnbuckle doesn't work to connect it. So I was like, okay, well, that doesn't work. So uh, what else we got? All right. All right. So I asked the guys to take, give me a couple pieces of 20 foot pipe, bring them in, threw them on the ground, uh, put some carpet down, threw them on the ground, put some uh, baby powder on them so they didn't squeak, threw the dolly up there, didn't tell anybody, and then did the shot. So, you know, everybody loved it. It was all great. So it was like, okay, well, here's the drill. Now that we're going to be skinning up on a Pee Wee a lot. Looks like we're going to use a lot of speed rail off the truck. So I can't tell you how many shots we did on that movie that uh, I was just throwing down, you know, a couple sticks of speed rail, putting them, you know, maybe 30 feet, 20 and a 10, married together with like a four foot piece of one inch in between, stagger the joints, dump a bunch of baby powder on it, and then I uh, hope David doesn't come by and look at it. And, you know, he just sees the frame and, and nobody notices. So it was fun. We had a good time. We had a, we had a good time in spite of the, the movie itself was um, a little dark, but everybody was super cool. And so I find that, you know, when people are cool, you have a good time, you make, you know, you make the film and off you go. 113 so. shooting days on that one. And we went, we, went from, we went from September to Christmas on six day weeks. That'll give you some idea of yeah. the work that goes into it. But what, what I thought of actually, Brad, while you were saying that was, remember how we would have to convince him to use dance floor. He hates dance floor. He wants to be yeah. on track all the time. And the reason he hates dance floor is he knows that, that the dolly grip, unless he's super, super careful resetting, the dolly's going to skew. And it's not like you're going to do two takes and walk away. You're going to do 30 takes. So after 30 takes, he cannot be convinced that you can't get the lens in the same spot on take 27, 28, 29, 30, and so on. So he wants to be on track. So Brad and I would have to go to him and say, you know, David, we really should be on floor here because we can do this and then we can come do this. And you'd have to make a pitch. You know, you would have to, yeah. you'd have to make a pitch for him to understand. And, and he's, he would get it, you know what I mean? We did dance floor shots on that, on that movie yeah. and he would get yeah. it, but it isn't the kind of thing where you just, let's just throw down floor and figure it out later. No, 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 no. That's not the way it works. You, you, you yeah. take the red, you use the, we had a red that we had stripped down as a, as a viewfinder and we would go with that thing and figure out exactly where we need to be and, with marks and you know um it's very precise it's it's that's the that's yeah, his style it's fun. It's fun, and what's yeah. what sticks out to me is how many directors you work with that uh know that the dolly skews on i work with directors that don't even know what i do you know yeah. how many of them know that the dolly tends to skew around on dance floor? oh he knows how to do our jobs as, yeah, as good as we do lot. you know the that, only yeah. jeff says to me uh the, jeff chrono you know said to me a couple of times says peter says the only reason we're here is because he can't do it all himself. <laughs> and there's a bit of truth to that, really. You know what I mean? Like he just, he needs to have someone there who he can totally trust and rely on and, and, uh, and, and give one of the, and give those strange instructions to, you know, like, you know, when Ben yeah. sits down, Peter, I need three more scan lines to the right, split yeah. the cup. Okay. So you do take one, you split the cup, take 10, I miss it. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, if this is the cup and I'm like, you know, I'll, I'll be here instead of here and cut, he says, cut. And, and when Fincher says cut, all the actors look down. Why? Because if they're off the mark, he's going to cut. So, so if it's me, usually I would say, guys, 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 don't look down. It's me over here. But that, that's the way he is. You know, he's so precise in the frame that he, he, he puts his faith in the actors and in the camera operator and the dolly grip that it's all going to be exactly as he imagined on all the takes. Yeah. Motion it was, control. It was interesting. It was fun. Yeah, because... There was a lot of stuff that we did inside like uh, a ballroom or a conference room uh, in Missouri. And we stacked um, the vibration isolator, which a lot of people don't like. Peter happens to like those a lot. So we ended up, you know, with a couple of them and we ended up stacking them and rolling on carpet and just. To, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because well, yeah. For, he doesn't use Steadicam. So it, it means that when you're moving the camera around, you have to think of what's feasible and um, we would, Brad and I, as Brad points out, I like, I like the vibration isolator and, and I, we did a test on this carpet. It was like concrete, right? It was concrete with carpet on top or something. Anyway, yeah. so we did a test, Brad and I, and I looked at the eyepiece and I go, no, it's, it's 80% there. 
and it's not there. And then I turn to Brad and I go, Brad, have you ever put one on top of another? And he goes, uh, let's give it a go. <laughs> so we had, we had the, the, the camera, the head, and two vibration isolators. So now there's, it's like this. And I got to tell you guys, it worked. Just that yeah. little bit that was left over from vibration head, vi, vi, VI number one, VI number two, took it out. And it's not something I recommend to do all the time because if you're doing a fast move, it's very hard to control what the camera's right. doing up there. But uh, this move was uh, my job basically up there at the top is just to tame it, just to, yeah. to, keep, it from, to keep it from going right. berserk. Yeah. yeah. And that, 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 that actually brings up something that I hadn't thought of with, with vibration isolators. There are a lot of operators that A, don't, don't, have never used, don't know how to use them, and B, Hate them. aren't happy with them. And I've had, I've, on the flip side, I've been, you know, uh, had a shot over basically a gravel road and, and had the uh, DP turn it to me and say, can't you put the vibration isolator on? I say, it's not a magic vibration isolator. <laughs> it wasn't made by elves. It's just not going to work, you know? So, but that's, I've never thought of doing that. I'm, that's a good tip to have. Um, well, it's, it's survival, it's survival filmmaking is what it is. <laughs> yeah. 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 We have to come up with it's something. Just, yeah. Yeah. You got to figure something out. Yeah. And then, you know, you're talking about the dolly skewing out of the way. Um, for a long time, I used a lot of, I used hybrid for a long time. I, I was a big Chapman guy. I used hybrid on a bunch of movies. And recently I've been using, uh, with Frank, I've been using the 10. And uh, I find that the 10 doesn't walk as much as, the Fisher doesn't walk as much as the Chapman does. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you got a Chapman dolly and it's walking around on you, uh, a lot of you guys know, you know, what, at least what I do sometimes is you go through your little move and then you figure out how far out it's, it's getting. So then you go to number one, you kind of throw it out on for a, a, a skew so that by the time you get to where you're going it should be straight mm -hmm. and um you know and, and the only hard part about that stuff is or not the hard part but the concerning things is when you're jamming around on something like that and then you gotta like shoot through a doorway at the end of the deal yeah. so you gotta make sure at some point you kind of square yourself up you gotta hide it somewhere or, mm -hmm. or make it to where at that point you're kind of straight so that when you go back and out of the door um you don't you know embarrass mm -hmm. yourself too much and smash into things yeah um, yeah you do a hundred you do a hundred foot walk it you do a hundred foot walk and talk down a hallway and by the end of it you're shooting over the dolly you know yeah um, yeah um so, cool um and now uh, uh usually what i ask is um is what kind of, is there a shot that both of you together kind of looked at and went oh god how are we going to do this and you kind of both figured it out together and i asked brad about this this morning or this afternoon peter i didn't get a chance to call you but i figured brad would just relay everything to you anyway um but uh brad <laughs> brad said there was a shot in uh memoirs of a, of a geisha that um you remember you talking about that crane shot the double crane shot brad well that was a different movie but um, oh, which whichever shot whichever yeah but while you brought up memoirs, I'm bringing up more crane shot in memoirs. Um, yeah. We were we were out in Ventura Farms. I think it was. They built a village, the the Japanese village, and then uh, Scotty Robinson was the key grip at the time, and Don Reynolds uh, was his rigging key. Al Castillo, I think I saw Al on here, was the best born for Don, and they built a facility out there, and they you know they built a truss system that covered the entire town with silk so that we could shoot and have beautiful light uh, during the day. So they wanted, to, they wanted to fly a camera across the tops of the, of the roofs of all the buildings in the, in the wintertime. And they were thinking about putting up like a spider cam or something like that, but that wasn't gonna work out. So Don, Al and the guys built this platform and Al might, you can shake his head yes or no, I don't know if uh, it's correct, but I think it was something like 30 feet tall, like 50 feet long and 20 feet wide. And then we stuck a 50-foot techno up there. I think uh, Joe Rodmill was on the pickle and I was on the arm. And uh, I'm not sure who was on the chassis at the time. It might have been easy. And, you know, and so then we armed across and sucked in and did a couple things. And, you know, went from over to this area and then came across and kind of ended up going into like a little window where one of the, one of the girls were. And in the movie, the window kind of closes. And I think they cut out of the shot. But. That was kind of fun, you know. It was, uh, I actually, I actually have that. Everybody, I have involved. that shot right here, Brad. I can, I think I can screen share it. You have a clip, okay? Yeah, we got clips. We love clips. clips. I think so. Can you see that, yeah, guys? Yeah, yeah. I see that. You see it full screen? Yeah. Awesome. 
Okay, okay great. So, um, yeah, I was going through Geisha the other day and I found this. Um, you have sound as well? Oh, we hear you. No. Okay, never mind. So, Brad, you can talk through. This is just the lead into that shot he was talking about. Yeah. Right, so this I'm marks a transition out. in the story from yeah. the time she's a little girl, now she's grown up. Right. So, so yeah, Brad, here, you can, you can talk through this one here. This is the beginning of the crane shot Brad just discussed. Okay, so we're just, uh, you know, Dolly and the 50 footer swinging it across the roofs. They wanted to kind of go down the, go down the uh, road there. Uh, of course, at the time, you know, we didn't have any monitors or anything like that up there with us. We're just kind of uh, seeing where we're at and kind of winging it as we go and figuring it out. And, uh, you know, it was just uh, all hands on deck, moving the, moving the chassis, swinging the arm, pickling it in, going across everything, and then ending up on. I think that was. I left this one on there, there, Brad, because this is a pretty good low mode shot that you did. I don't know if you remember this. Look at this, how you hit this mark. Look at this. Uh, oh, yeah. Wow. Right? I don't remember. Right? Looks like I did good, though. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's classic Brad Ray there, guys. <laughs> <laughs> the funny thing about this movie was, um, you know, it was so much fun to work on because the director, uh, is such a he and his partner you know they're big into choreography and stuff and, and they're super nice guys and dion is one of the nicest cameramen ever we had a great crew great group crew great uh, set lighting but inside the the what are the, the hanamachi the, yeah the, the village the houses in the village everything was different heights so when we were we put down a lot of dance floors so we had bucks and mango was talking about uh the other day he had bucks that were, you know, one by two, aluminum, uh, welded together, ground off. And then you can bolt those aluminum bucks together. Me, on the other hand, I had the old school uh, two by six, two by four bucks stacked mm -hmm. on top of each other, clear two by six, clear two by fours, same thing, four by eight. But when they marry together, they stack like this, and then the other one stacks next to it. So it's instead of the aluminum of the new wave, because it's so easy to put on the truck, I had the big bulky wooden stuff uh, that's heavier and, and that kind of yeah. stuff. But for me, I liked it better because you can just build the heck out of it. So we threw a bunch of bucks down, level them all up, put a bunch of plywood down, and then we were able to scoot all over there with the, with the ladies. And it was fun because there was a lot of shots where, you know, the big crane shots and you got all the toys and stuff, all that's super cool. But what I kind of like and what a lot of guys, I shouldn't say a lot of guys, but what people need to think about and remember is that those nice little slow little creepy shots and the push-ins and coming around and getting over, over somebody and then going around and looking at something else, those kind of shots for me are a lot of fun to do and, and fun to work on because you get to tell a little bit of a story. You're not racing in to do something and coming to a crash and stop. But, you know, you're going slow and, and the actors are doing their thing and, and it's more intimate. And, and I, I enjoy that. That's a lot of fun. You know, guys, um, if I can just say anything, you need to make sure that you don't forget about, uh, you know, just being able to do a nice slow pushing or a nice little transition. Um, I was watching, change the subject real quick, I was watching Ozark the other day, and I forget the guy's name. Please forgive me. Um, but there's so many shots where everything was just creeping across like this one, just telling the story, and there's a little dialogue going over it. And that kind of stuff. Uh, I like that kind of stuff. I think that's Mark that, Tanya. That's Mark Tanya, who is, was in it, here before. Yeah. Mark. I don't know him, but he did a great job. Yeah. Well, kudos on that, yeah. Yeah. So. Um, yeah. Uh, and um, Peter, is there a shot that you remember? And I hate to put you on the spot. If you don't, it's fine. Because I asked Brad this morning. He said, I don't know, man. There's so many so long ago. Is there a shot that you remember that was difficult? And, and you, you and Brad both looked at it and said, what are we going to do here? And can you tell me how you, how you fix it? If you can't, it's fine. Cause I know you've got, no, know I got, I got, I got one of those. I got okay. one of those. Um, it was the second Ant-Man, uh, Ant-Man and the Wasp. And we there? were in, you were there, you were there. That's right. There. That's right. And it was the shot, um, Daryl, when we're in um, Pim's lab, uh, the one with the big, the big shrinking tunnel, the, yeah. the, the quantum realm tunnel mm -hmm. and what, what Peyton wanted. And, and it helps actually, because Peyton Reed, uh, I've been his camera operator for uh, 25 years. I mean, I've operated all his movies 
and and Brad has been on many of them. So he now he guy. actually he Google calls me guy. and he goes, uh, okay, so we got a movie. Uh, can you please check if Brad's available? So he he really uh, appreciates um, you know having his team with him, particularly uh, Brad. So anyway, we're it would have been a steady cam shot because the shot kind of goes around. It's a very long walk and talk, three characters, uh, and it would have been a conventional steady cam shot, very easy, except that it ends up where they walk up a metal grate, a metal stairs, and end up on this riser in front of this um, array. And in order to um, promote the cut, we needed to be over Michael Douglas's right shoulder. So basically, we're leading them up the stairs, and then Michael had to turn around, and I settle on a shot over the shoulder of Mr. Douglas, and then that promotes a cut, and that's the end of that shot. And the thing is, in order for me to get there, it would have been a ramp because I couldn't come up the stairs because I would be in the wrong spot. So I needed to be the camera right. So it would have been a very, very long ramp. Uh, it would have been a huge build and it would have been extremely demanding to get up that backwards, settle perfectly. So I turned to Brad and, uh, and, I, and I, remember, I remember this moment because like, there's a little, always a little bit of panic before anything like that. And I go to Brad, I go, Brad, what are we gonna do? I didn't want anyone else to hear this because everyone just wants confidence from the operator. But then when no one's listening, I would go to Brad and go, Brad, what the fuck are we going to do? <laughs> and, and, and so uh, Brad came up with the idea of measuring. First, we measured the two heights. We measured where the lens had to be at the end and where it had to be for the walk and talk. And did we have enough boom range? And we did, barely. I think maybe you remember this, Brad, but it was just, we just barely right. made it. And he said, okay, we'll put the Oculus on. We'll run this on the Oculus. We'll put in a six inch riser or whatever math you did. And I gotta tell you, take one was perfect. It, you know, the Oculus took out all the, I love that head by the way, took out all the um, irregularities of the floor. And then when the cast started going up the stairs, Brad just kept going with them, kept going with them. And then we end up perfect over, turns around, we're in over Michael's shoulder, exactly where we need to be, and then cut to the other side. Had I remembered that, I probably could have pulled that shot. But mm -hmm. anyway, but that was a Brad Ray special because really I was, you know, special. doing it My on. My mom a... always told me I was special. <laughs> yeah. But that was that was <laughs> that was a perfect example of the belly grip, you know, yeah. saving your ass. You know, Daryl, you might remember this leading leading. I say leading into that. Uh, one of the things was Pim's laboratory was hey, it looked great. You know, Shep was the uh, production center and it looked fantastic. Except all over the floor in different areas. They had like circles cut out of the metal yeah. floor. So it was all these holes in the floor. Yeah. To give it so texture, it like, to give it texture in the distance. Yeah. So you see yeah. like, yeah. So yeah. it was like, all right, that looks great. It's holes in the floor. But to dolly on that stuff, yeah. um, you either got to try and take your wheels in between all the holes, which was, mm -hmm. it was doable, but it was kind of like, if they're all over the place, it was kind of funky. Yeah. So I was talking to Peter and I go, hey man, we got to figure something out here. And so then uh, I went to Chef and I said, hey Chef, I go, you got to do me a favor. They were about more well, they were probably an inch and an eighth or something like yeah. that, whatever they were thick. And I said, You gotta cut me a bunch of hockey pucks, bro. Cut me a bunch. I gotta fill these holes. So cut me a bunch of hockey pucks and then cut the center of the same height and the same size. And I think it was like a piece of plywood and a piece of centro mm -hmm. made it flush, made it runnable. Yeah. So uh thankfully the art department got together with that and uh I don't know, they cut hundreds of those things and everyone <laughs> hundreds. Got, we, hundreds. Yeah, we, we pull them up and the put floor. them in boxes. And, yeah. yeah, yeah, and it was like, okay, we got a run down this side, so we fill in all blanks. Yeah, and then we do our little thing. There. We're yeah. going to the other side. We pull out yeah. all the hockey pucks and go yeah. to the other side. Yeah, so Who, who's that was a great. Then? That was another great suggestion. Yeah. The hockey puck, yeah. the hockey puck thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, you have to. I mean, you got to try and get along with everybody. So you have to try and you know, um, I don't want to say make friends with everybody, but you have to collaborate. You know. And so if something comes up, because it always seems like the art department, they never make the doors wide enough. They always make the room seven foot 11 instead of eight feet. So if you can get in there early and ask them, say, hey, man, can you make the doorway a little wider for me? Can you, you know, give me an inch so I don't have to cut down, you know, 100 sheets of plywood to get in this place. Um, hopefully they'll be accommodating. And uh, most of the time they make a really nice looking floor that you can't roll on as opposed to making a floor that looks still super good but you can roll on it and nobody knows the difference except right. you. So, right. yeah. yeah.
good problem solving from the dolly grip. Um, There's a good point yeah. there, you know, that, that I don't think anyone's ever dealt with really. Maybe, maybe other of our talented dolly operators listening to this would know, but it, it almost seems like the dolly grip should get called in at a certain point in construction. Just, you know, just to walk through the sets yeah. with the set designer yeah. to say, okay, this is what we're doing in here. And, and, and you know, I mean, all you guys know, you walk into a set and you know if there's trouble in there. Oh, that doorway, I can't get through that doorway. And hey guys, can we like, and those kind of problems could be solved so quickly and easily at that stage. By the time we get in there, it's painted, it's set, it's fixed. Mm -hmm. Um, oh, you guys want to take the, the door jams off? Uh, geez, I don't know. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, and all of a sudden you're on the wrong device. So it almost seems like it, it, there should be some way of saying, okay, I don't even need to be there. It's just Brad, really. You know, Brad needs to walk through yeah. that one yeah. time. As, yeah. as, I was just actually as lucky enough to do that on, on something. I, actually, there's a movie I did with Mitch. Uh, uh, Johnny probably wasn't available, so whenever John's not available, Mitch calls me up, and, and my first question is, why are you calling me, man? Where's Mango? So um, we did this movie with Manny Duran, and Mitch took me on the scout, and there was a shot where, um, oh, gosh, Mitch is going to have to help me out. I forgot her actress's name, Black Swan. Real oh, super yeah. nice girl. Natalie Portman. Natalie, Natalie Portman. Thank you very much, Natalie Portman. Very, very nice woman. Well, she's walking down the hallway, but they wanted her to kind of float. And she goes down this, this hallway in a, in a hospital. Then we go through a doorway. And then we go around a bed. And they just want to pull back from this bed. But the room was whatever it was. So what they did was the art department, I talked to the production designer, and they made the walls kind of go into a vanishing point and left it open at the end, about you know, 25 feet away. So they measured my shoulders and the width of the dolly when we were on the scout. And then when we got there, we rigged up the, rigged up the dolly with a little platform in the front put the remote head on there, braced everything off. She rode the dolly with me back through the, back through the doorway, around a bed, and then she steps off. So, you know, it just kind of looks like she just kind of steps off, goes up to the bed. We send her up on the bed and go back, 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 back. And then I end up going out the hole in the wall. Mm -hmm. And I think I had, you know, they didn't give me a lot of room, but there was a little bit of room on either side. And it was one of those deals where you had to kind of square yourself up before you get back there. So, um, you know, yeah, and we, we made it. Yeah, that sounds great. I don't know how it looks. I never saw the movie, but um, we had a good time. Yeah. So well, that's a good job I, by everybody. I think Peter brings up a, a, it's a point that all of us as Dolly Grips have probably said a thousand times, why didn't I go on the scout? Because you get there and same thing you guys are talking about. I did a movie you years ago and we had a big office set and, and for some reason, they brought me in to walk through the set at Sony or somewhere. And I walked in the big, it was Tom Cruise's office and they had a, like a 5,000 pound desk on top of a rug that was about three inches thick. And I went to the right. DP and I said, we got like three weeks in this office and you're going to want to do a lot of dance floor. What are we going to do about this? He looked at it and he said, you're right. He had art department, pull the desk, pull the rug. And I think they painted the rug on the floor. That was a long time ago. I think that's what they did. And it saved us, you know, Right, exactly. Can't imagine how much, mm -hmm. but um, mm -hmm. uh, so that's uh, great tips there, guys. Um, Sean, uh, we can ask some questions, or uh, what do you think, Sean? Um, there was something I wanted to, to the add. studio audience. Yeah, uh, you know, Brad, I tend to agree with you, and and the shot that that Peter showed, the low shot where you stuck the ending, those are the kind of shots that I really like. I like. Like when we're doing action movies, you can barely pay attention to what's happening in the scene because you're trying not to slam the camera into people and stuff around you. Yeah. I like to be in there and watching the scene and arriving at the right moments. Like I, I totally related to what you said. Uh, yeah, it's, it's fun. Like being it's part fun. of the process and not just being operating some big piece of machinery that's uh, being swung around. I really like that. Um, yeah, it's um, I'm gonna if, let me just tell. I want to tell a couple yeah. quick stories. Yeah, I don't mean to bore anybody, but um, this is a couple of different movies. Peter wasn't there, but uh, I did a movie with uh, Bobby Gray was key in it, and Chiba was the DP. I think I told Daryl about this earlier. Yeah. It was called the Walk in the Cloud. Cloud. And um, mm -hmm. the front, the opening shot is what they want to do is they want to start with Keanu Reeves on the boat. Uh, he was uh, in the army, coming back from a troop transport, and they take him down this boat, and he comes down the, the ramp, and then goes out into the crowd, and then the, we crane up from the crowd. And they wanted to do it in a Warner. So 
uh, we got there in the morning and we had Titan crane. And uh, so then we built a mini linny on top of the Titan crane. We put down like a hundred feet of boom trap, which is, I don't know if you ever use it. It's, Moose might be able to help me out on this. It's probably 14 inches wide and about I don't know, six inches thick. It's gigantic. It takes four guys to carry it. But they used to lay it down for the crane. So you could crib it up and whatever, and then the crane could make a nice slow move. So um, they wanted to do it at magic hour, no lights, just magic hour, you know, perfect timing. So I think Bobby Gray was running the hot seat on the, on the crane, which is on the Titan crane, it can run electric too. So you flip up, you, you pull the cab off, you flip up the seat, you jam a um, handle in it and you put a brake pedal on there. So now he's got a throttle in one hand and a brake in the other with his foot. So I think Bobby was on the hot seat. I think I had Chard and Kenny King on the bucket. And then I was up on the platform with the mini Lenny. So we rehearsed it all day long and we had the headsets, the old concert com headsets. And the boys were, you know, well back out of the way because it was going to rain. So we rehearse it. We do it, you know, a bunch of times. We get it all down. Everybody's all dialed in. And uh, so now it's big panic. Sun's going down. Throw your rain gear on. Put all your stuff on. Hop up there. And they yell, okay. And we're you know, cue the rain. So now it starts raining and it's pouring down rain. And then in the headsets here, okay, and <laughs> so the headset <laughs> shorts out. So I was like, all right, headset shorts out, it's raining. You know, we got a couple cracks at it. Here we go. So, uh, you know, I don't know if anybody else hear anything. I couldn't hear anything. So then, they, you know, they yelled action and we went ahead and did our whole cha-cha. And I got the shot. Everything worked out good, except at the very end, they had to cut in because all the umbrellas were masking everything, so they did a quick cut, and then we kind of boomed up on everybody. But that was kind of fun, because it was, it was, you know, the Titan crane making the move, the two arms articulating like this, before we, you know, we didn't have the techno crane up there. And uh, everybody's, you know, swinging the big arm, and I'm going around on the other thing, and, and uh, of course, doing it with, without hearing anything was kind of interesting, so fun. Yeah. Fun. But... Another quick story, real quick. Sorry about this. <laughs> you're here, to tell, you're here to talk. So I did a movie called A Few Good Men where Jack Nicholson, this uh, kind of a famous scene, sitting in the jury box, screaming at Tom Cruise, you can't handle the truth, Danny. You can't do this, you can't do that. And I slow push in on Jack. So then, um, you know, so we did that movie. And then there was another movie that we were in, Statesville Penitentiary, doing a thing called Natural One Killers. So I'm rolling Bob Richardson down the cell block. You know, these it was 100 cells long, six stories tall. So you got 600 cells with guys. It's noisy, it's loud, it's all kinds of stuff. So I end up going down the thing and stopping in front of this one cell, cell 111. And of course, you don't want to look in a cell because this is somebody's home. It'd be like somebody like looking in your dining room window or something like that. You know, you sitting at your dining room table, so it's a little awkward. So Bob jumps off the dolly, he runs away, and I'm standing there. And so I'm kind of like side-eyeing this dude to see what's going on. And I look over, and this, this guy, resident, as I call him, was sitting on his bed. And on the six feet away, on the other wall, was a little tiny TV set. And on that TV set was Jack Nicholson sitting in the, in the jury or in the box doing that scene. He was watching A Few Good Men. And I'm just sitting there looking at this dude watching A Few Good Men in this federal penitentiary with maniacs going on. And just like... <laughs> <laughs> All right, it's kind of interesting. You know, it's just an interesting little deal. So, and then, make a long story longer, the guy was huge, and he uh, he came up to his cell door, and so now I look over at him, and he leans against the wall, and he, like, works his door, like, four or five times, and every time he does the door, he, like, becomes the hole. And then he finally broke his door open and opened up his cell door. So he <laughs> crashes his door open, and, of course, my sphincter goes <laughs> like this. And I'm looking at this dude, and he just walks out and looks at me. And then goes down two cells and puts his hand out. And this guy puts the phone in his hand. He walks back, plugs it in above his cell, goes inside and makes a phone call. And I'm just sitting there going, man, I can't. What am I doing here? <laughs> so it was interesting. It was fun. But there yes, you go. a real moment. All right. Yeah, it was crazy. Sean, uh, you got anything? No, I was just, I just wanted to talk about that. It's all, it's all you. You have the questions. Okay. Hang on. Sorry. Oh, here we go. Oh boy! You mean you mean start with one that I liked? Yeah, start with one you liked. Cause, uh... So uh, Riley Wood, I'm gonna unmute you. Um, 
we're asking to mute. Riley's asking, I have a question for both Brad and Peter, more so Brad, I think. As a younger Dolly Grip, I'm always hired by Keys or Best Boys here in Atlanta. I have noticed that on a couple of jobs I've been on where the A camera Dolly Grip is hired by the GP or operator, not the key. I was wondering how they got to the point in their career to choose who you work with in that aspect, and if Brad has ever had any problems coming onto a new crew. If so, what situations were you put in, and how did you deal with it? Um, so I don't see Riley on my little screen. I guess I could uh, Hey, what's up, guys? There he is. Hi, Riley. Hi, this is Riley. my first time caller. <laughs> okay. Um, you know what? Uh, I think if we if you haven't been through that situation, you will come through that situation. I've been on both sides of the fence. Um, you know, I've I've gone in on a job. Daryl was kind enough to let me come in and, and work with Peter. Um, yeah, just... Done a couple other jobs where somebody says, "Hey, I got a guy." And then I've also been hired on a job where you get a phone call and say, hey, uh, you know, uh, the operator wants to use this guy. And as a matter of fact, it was with Jack Duter, who's down here somewhere, when we worked together on The Rock years ago. Um, Mitch, Mitch Dubin was the, was the operator, and he was using Jack back then. And uh, I got the call, and so I was like, yeah, sure, man. I get my, get my gear on, get the rate, all that kind of stuff. And then Jimmy Dunford, who was candid, calls up and said, hey, uh, they got this guy, the operator, new operator wants to use this guy. I'm like, all right. I go, well, do I still get my rate? Yeah. Do I still get my rental? Yeah. I said, well, okay. who's the guy? He says, Jack Glenn. I go, dude, I, I, I know Duder. Jack and I met on the gang in 1977, you know? So it's like, um, I'm like, yeah, man, bring him in. We had a great time. I had a fun job on that. Um, so I think not to, other than the fact that I probably forgot the whole question and I'm rambling, but if you just like be yourself and when you go in with a new crew, you know, you make sure you, Hey, you're coming in on a new crew with a bunch of guys that have worked together. So, you know, you have to kind of blend in, you have to be yourself, mm -hmm. introduce yourself, make sure, uh, you know, you let everybody know who you are and what's going on. And then just, you know, do your job, man. You do your job and hopefully they'll all do your, their job and they'll help you out because you really need the help of the grip crew. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, we're kind of on an island by ourselves, but you can't do the job by yourself. You know, you need the guys to help out. And, um, you know, you know, don't don't come in like, hey, man, I'm, I'm the guy and I'm oh, coming yeah, yeah, in yeah. to do my thing. You just come in and, you know, do your job. And then once they see that, you know, uh, that you're doing your job and and by you doing your job it makes their job easier um, you know, so far so good it hasn't really been that big an issue fantastic yeah I also wanted to know um, uh, like when did you start getting calls from operators to do gigs instead of keys as well uh, something I would like to eventually get to once I get there is to have you know guys well, who I really want to work with give me right. a call that aren't in the grip department if that makes sense well, the interesting thing is, is um, uh, you have to, the operator has to have that kind of relationship with the DP before he can call and say, hey, I got a dolly okay. grip that I want to use. You know, first off, the DP has to trust the operator that, you know, I'm hiring you as my guy and I'm taking, you know, what you have to say as, as um, the gospel and that kind of stuff. And then if you have a good relationship with an operator, and the way you do that is just by building relationships. Okay. This whole business is about relationships. If you're a guy on B camera or whatever, and you're working with a the B camera operator, you guys work well together. And you know what, someday, or maybe the next day or whatever, that guy's gonna have an opportunity to say, you know what, hey, I remember I worked with Riley. We had a good time. He knows what he's doing. He has, he, he might've bumped up to A and he's like, hey, Riley, are you available? You know? Okay. And so, the DP has to be able to talk to the key grip and the key grip, you know, the operator has to have a good relationship with those guys. And when did this start happening? I don't know, man. It's just, uh, uh, you know, one day you get a phone call and uh, it, it's Peter or, uh, you know, it's somebody saying, Hey, are you available uh, for this date? And, you know, I'm always available unless I'm working. So, uh, and what happens is, you know, when you get old, you get to know more guys and then they start calling. So, you just right gotta on, get man. older, bro. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm uh, 29, <laughs> turned 30 this year, so All right. young gun. Well, congratulations. Yeah, I know. Yeah. 
you, you it's know, basically relationships, Riley. That is all comes down mm -hmm. to relationships. It's doing a good job, yeah. getting out there, no matter what camera on you're on. If you're on the D camera, C camera, it doesn't matter. You want to do the best job you can. You want to be personable. You never want to get upset. You never want to shout. You never want to just be a good person. And then, um, and then your reputation will carry you forward. And then one day, an operator is going to go. You know, we had Riley. You know, can I, is check with you available? And that's mm. how it happens. It's just going to happen on its yeah. own. There isn't a there isn't a path other than a. You got to be a good person, and you have to be really good at your job. Those exactly. are the two things. And then, then, then you just keep going, and then eventually you're going to get calls. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Yeah. You know, very few op very few key grips will um, fight an operator that wants to be a do bring in a dolly grip because okay. it's just one less thing for the key grip to worry about. You know, if they if they're a team, he knows that that's going to work out, and he'll be or he or she will be happy about that. So that's mm -hmm. that's one of the things that happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Uh, Thanks, you guys. Sure. Um, here's one from uh, Jaron Berm Berman. Berman, sorry, Jaron, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. Um, it says, here's my rambling question for the meeting. Um, as a dolly grip, you work with so many DPs and directors of various styles, which makes you sort of an encyclopedia of solutions and tricks. Um, how do you share that experience to not just streamline the mechanics of a shot but also push your work creatively and aesthetically. How do you collaborate creatively to tap into your specific body of knowledge and experience? Um, I think that kind of goes along as, as we talked about this last week is you do thousands of shots and you kind of build up a mental file of what works and what doesn't. And we've talked about mm -hmm. that before. I think that's kind of what he's asking. How do you implement all that? Well, you know, like when, when the director or the DP or whatever, when they, when they're laying a shot out, um, a lot of times if I go in on a new crew and the camera department uh, is familiar with the DP and, and they're a familiar crew with that. A lot of times the first they see loves to run in there, and, you know, put a mark out on the floor where the lens is or the second, you know, they're always doing that kind of stuff. So I kind of lay back a little bit. I, I watch what's going on. I'm within, you know, with an earshot with then I can chime in or do whatever but a lot of times I'll lay back and just watch what they're doing you know because for me what I need to know is I need to know where you want to start where you want to end where you want to be at a certain time you know and you can kind of see what the height they're going to do so when all this is going on you're mentally going through your checklist of what piece of gear that you might have or what piece of gear you might need to do something like this and then and then if it's a bunch of new people um, hopefully they they kind of defer to you and say okay well you know we're gonna this is our shot we're gonna go dance floor and it's like well all right dance floor is gonna be good but you know really we can save you a little bit of time here if i throw a couple one buys down you know otherwise we gotta like pick up the table and get all this stuff and make some cuts and all you're doing is you're just kind of rolling in to a little bit of push if you want to throw a big dance floor down that's no big deal and go ahead and do it do it all the time but, you know, you just have to kind of like Daryl said, you've done, over time, you end up doing so many shots. I mean, you can only do this and do that to make it go like that so many times. I mean, it's, you know, you're going in and it's going up and you're going up and it's going down. And so, you know, you kind of, you kind of get used to it in a way, you know, not that you think it's no big deal because every shot's its own animal, but you, um, you know, so you might not get as, I mean, my palms get sweaty sometimes, but they don't get sweaty every time. So when you have to kind of figure something out, you know, you can kind of fall back on what you know. And then you just operator, if you don't have a relationship with them and they're new or whatever, this is where you start a relationship. Say, hey, what do you think about, you know, are you comfortable if I do this? Or do you feel that, you know, uh, would you like to do that? And, uh, you know, so that's where you start that relationship you know it starts with a, an introduction and it starts with a conversation so don't be afraid to i'm not saying impose your will on somebody with a shot but don't be afraid to um become part of the conversation and say hey you know what do you think if we do this or do you, you know what if we do that then we can i can get you over here or if i stick you out on this piece of equipment you know i can i can end up over here and i don't have to do this and the other thing and because it's all, you know, they want to save time and 
you know, you don't ever want to do a shortcut, but, uh, you know, you don't want to make a big deal out of something that's not a big deal necessarily. I don't know if that helps. I don't know if that's the right answer. You the rambling answer or I rambling think, question? I rambling think it's a pretty answer. good answer. Yeah. I think it's a pretty good answer, Brad. Um, uh, Jeffrey Smith, uh, this question is for Brad, but I think Peter will. Schmitty? Well, yeah, Peter will be able to speak to this also from an operator's standpoint. On occasion, we will work with operators that we don't know and have never worked with. How do you handle a situation where you feel you've sufficiently proven yourself as an A-list dolly grip, but the operator refuses to take any advice or collaborate in any way? Do you just keep your mouth shut and do as you're told, or would you have a conversation about why they don't want to benefit from your expertise? As you know, you are a team, and it only takes one of you to bring down that team. No doubt all dolly grips will be in this situation eventually. You got that? A good question. Is that for you? Yeah. It's for both of you. You you go, Brad. Well, <laughs> when had enough of Brad? Yeah. My mouth. Okay, I'll I'll take it then. You know, the the the, the answer the, the answer is there's no real answer, but the the to to distill your question down to its very core, you want to know if you find yourself on set as the person with either more experience than the operator that you're working with, or maybe the better idea then what's happening, how do you handle yourself politically? Do you interject? Do you change the way it's going? And the simple answer here is you need to be wise politically. By that I mean you need to have already sussed out the, the power relationship on set, the creative, um, the, cre the creative elements on set. Is it a DP who's very, very specific and controlling or is it a DP who leaves it all up to the operator? Is it an operator who loves input or one that's maybe insecure and doesn't want input because sometimes when someone's insecure, they want to feel like their idea is the best thing in the room. So the, the answer to your question is, is interwoven with the politics of filmmaking. And like it or not, we all have to deal with it. I deal with it, Brad deals with it, everyone does. So the, the, the simple answer is be gracious, be um, private. By that I mean, um, Sometimes what I'll do is, uh, if it's a director who I don't really have a relationship with, but I've done many movies with the DP, I will come over to the DP and put my lips so that he can just hear my voice and go, hey, you know what? I noticed when we, when we pulled in, you know, she was looking a little, uh, a little rough around the eyes. Just, you know, keep an eye on something. And you only throw that out to him. So, and, and then you go back to the doll, you get on there and you notice all of a sudden there's a bounce card going in there. So you don't have to make your suggestions more public than they have to be. Sometimes it's worth it just to whisper to the operator, hey, you know, we might be able to do this on a piece of track, skinny the track and come in right in here. What do you think about that? And shit, me, like I, I never profess to be the smartest guy in the room. Like, you know, I, I learned early in my career that, that a great idea can come from anyone, but you're asking questions about when do you start contributing? When do you start? Is there a path? Is there a line that you have to cross? There isn't because it's all based on your relationships and also the people you're working with. So it's a complicated question and I'm sorry to make the answer so complex, but it, it, it's all intertwined with set politics and set discipline. And you will be the best person to determine that as you start working and, and building relationships. You'll know the answer to that question soon enough. Yeah. Does that make sense? The great answer, yeah. Yeah, because re the relationship whole thing, and, and you, it's, I mean, I hate to hammer, you know, something a lot, but it, everything revolves around the relationship. The relationship you have with your operator, the relationship you have with the DP, the relationship that you have with the, the, the set dresser, the on-set dresser, the wardrobe person, the makeup person, because, I mean, we're not really the last line of defense, but you know what? What do we do? We stand behind the dolly. Somebody shows up. We look at them. You look at the guy. You look at the woman. You see what's going on. And it's like, you know what? Maybe their hair's a little funky. And nobody's, you know, everybody's freaking out, but their hair's sticking out. Or the button's not buttoned. Or something's a little funky. Well, if you have a good relationship with the hairdresser, you might just say, hey, you know, take a peek. Or, or I always like just talk to the operator and say, hey, you got some flyaways there. What do you think about that? Or if you know the the costumer you just say you know what is his uh, shirt should it be a little bit no like oh hey thanks man or whatever and 
you know, I mean, I know that there's a bunch of you. How many times have you seen the mic hanging out or the mic cable hanging out of their back pocket or something like that? It's so where you just have to say, hey, you know what? I see, we're going to see a cable. We're going to see this or that. Because it kind of helps everybody out instead of going through the whole take and then finding out that their mic pack is sticking out of the back of their pants. You know, if you see it, you say something to somebody and then, uh, you know, they can, they can tidy it up and then everybody's happy. And, you know, you don't bring it, attention doesn't, doesn't come on somebody else down the line. You were able to kind of like, you know, help out. And you'll know who to pass those notes to. Yeah. You'll know. Yeah. It, like Brad says, if you have a relationship with the, with the onset costumer, then that's the person, you know, to, what you don't want to do is go to the AD and go, we got a mic pack. And then the AD has <laughs> got to get on the walkie. And then all of a sudden the spotlights on the sound department and you've made them look bad. And now, you know what I mean? What you want yeah. to do is what Brad's suggesting is, and then, you know, Brad has fed me hundreds and hundreds of notes like that, you know, like little things that, Sometimes I process them and go, okay, I'm going to fix that on take two. And sometimes I'll stop the train and I'll go, hey, hang on, we got to need to fix this. Um, so who to give that no to is a political choice you're going to make on set. And, and, but I think Brad is right. You know, you have to keep your eyes open. I always say that the camera operator and to many degrees, the dolly grip are kind of like, they're kind of like the gatekeeper. You know what I mean? Like, like in addition to the other stuff that we have to do, I'm the last point of return for something before it gets recorded. And, and, and I, I've trained some Steadicam operators, you know, I've run some Steadicam courses in my life and I, and I tell, I try and teach them with Steadicam too, which can be a problem, which is you start thinking that the most important thing in the world is the camera and your shot and everything else. That's the most important thing in the world. And I tell them, I said, dude, the greatest shot of your career, going, following them up the stairs, pivoting around, you know, going through doorways. The greatest shot, the, the take you're going to love so much is going to be unusable because the guy's collar was sticking up and you didn't point it out to the correct um, person to fix it. So you're going to go again. So the thing is, you, you have to make everyone else's job work. We, we have to make, we are the people, I said this on the last time we did this, is that is that really the operator and the dolly grip are the closest to the performers and need to facilitate everyone else's work. We need to watch out and be the, and be the last point, the last gatekeeper for everyone, hair, makeup, wardrobe, lighting, everything. Any, something you notice, then all of a sudden no one else is gonna see it because you're right there. So then you can easily pass that note delicately to the right department. It's super important to keep your eyes open and look outside yeah. the frame. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that's a great, thank you for that also, Peter, because we have a lot of uh, ladies and gentlemen in the operating uh, realm in, in, the, in this meeting also, so I'm sure they're happy to hear from, hear, hear, hear from that. Um, Sean, you want to have somebody wave or you want to pick a question? I, well, Jeff, does that answer your question? Yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, I think uh, initially what Peter said was, was right on. You know, I put it out there for all the younger dolly grips because they are going to have this issue uh, sooner or later. Um, yeah, there's definitely a political aspect to it. Sometimes you have to bite your tongue. Um, I realized that I had recently been in that situation where, you know, Brad can relate to this, where you might say something like, well, you know what, what do you think about uh, dance floor? Because I know we're going to have to end up here and I'm not going to have room with the, you know, and you just keep getting poo pooed by your operator. And you really know in your heart, you're not, you're not imposing your will. You're just doing your job. You're being professional. You are being political. You're doing all those things that Peter said, which is, which is definitely right on, but you get to a position where you're like, you know, you start to feel it if, if your whole body. You know, obviously, you're not happy at that point in your job, but you're like, okay, am I going to stick this out? Because if I keep saying stuff, the operator is going to say, I'm the boss. Listen, I, I don't care. You might be right, but I'm the boss. We don't want to do it that way. Maybe, maybe the question is, Brad, have you been in that situation? And, and, and uh, well, no, I'm not just referring to the Doris movie. What I'm asking. Right. Yeah. I was going to say, Schmitty and I, Schmitty's right here in my, my uh, 
computer screen. But Schmini and I met on the doors uh, way back uh, when. But um, you know what? For me nowadays, uh, I'm older. Uh, you know, I mean, I've been around the block a couple times. Uh, it has. Uh, you know, I, I, I work with a new operator. Matter of fact, I'm working with a new one on this last job I was working on. Great guy, uh, young guy, uh, like Riley, he's 30 years old. I mean, he's, you know, younger than my youngest kid. So, um, you know, it's like, you know, he comes up with something and I know it's wrong. And I'll say, you know what, I think we should maybe do something different. Or if he comes up with something, he's just like, hey, this is where we're going to do it. I'm like, you know what, that's a great, great idea, man. Great job. I think let's go that route and let's, you know, great job. You're, a, you're fantastic. I, I wish I had a thought of that, you know, and then we do it and uh, you know, you do the best you can and you make it work, but they're uncomfortable and it's not really happening for them. And they're in an awkward situation at the end and you know, you could have made it better. And then once they're all said and done, you look at them and you go, how'd that work out for you, bro? Happy with that, you know? And then, you know, if they're have to show it to them. Yeah. yeah, if they're receptive, then they'll figure it out and they'll be like, you know what, hey, you know what, maybe next time we go a little different route. And if not, then hey, it's going to be uh, an, it's going to be an interesting job. But the the light at the end of the tunnel is the way we work in this business is, you know what, our job it might be like the one movie Peter and I did 113 days or something like that. It's like a hockey season, but the season comes to an end. So. You know, if it's hateful and every day you go to work and you just want to strangle your operator, which um, I've never had that happen, but you just know that, you know what, at some point you do your job, you do the best you can, you help everybody out and the job's going to come to an end. And if that guy calls you again, you can always say, you can reevaluate at that point. Hey, I think I can do this again. Or, you know what, hey, thanks for calling. I'm booked. I wish I could, but I can't. So, you know, we have that ability because of the segmented way that our work is, is, you know, if it's horrible, it's going to come to an end and you can move on and maybe you have never have to work with that person again. Or if it's horrible and then it gets better, then it's like, hey, you know what, this could be the start of something good. And, uh, you know, Schmitty knows we worked with a guy that, um, you know, you want to grab him around the throat a couple of times. I think I might have, but, um, uh, you know, at the end of the day, man, everything works out. So, you know, <laughs> yeah. you know Jeff, think, there are going to be times, there are yeah. going to be times, Jeff, where, and I'm sure many of us have been in a situation where we know the tool we're on or the device we've chosen isn't the best thing for the shot. You, you know, in my case, I may have made a suggestion and they said, no, no, we want to do it this way. So we're doing it the way they want because they're ultimately the boss. and um, and there comes a point where you just have to lay back and, and do what, what's expected of you. You know, you have to back off is what I'm saying. You can't, you can't, you know, I always tell, you know, operators that, you know, the, the thing to remember is if the DP comes up to me and says, Peter, we want to put the camera up your ass and shoot it from there. The correct response to that is how high are we going? <laughs> you know what I mean? There, my point being is that we're a service profession. We have to yeah. give them what we're they're expecting. Department. And even if they want to go on track, they're pitching track. You're saying, no, it's really a dance floor might work better. No, pitch. go on track, shut the fuck up and do your job and get on the track and move on because you can't fight every battle. And you got to realize that maybe there's a, there's something going on that you're not even aware of that may impact that decision. So you make the, you make the pitch and you got to lay back and you got to just, yeah. Kind of get yeah. yeah. Back. That, what uh, Peter just said, you know, you might think that there's a different way to do it and something else. I mean, somebody, I saw a question that Sean sent me. Somebody had talked about there was a shot in Inherent Vice. I did a movie called Inherent Vice with uh, Paul Thomas Anderson. And we laid down some track and, and he wanted to put a dolly track down. And it was like, you know, PTA, this wouldn't be a bad place for a car with an arm or a car with a steady cam and we could drive next to the car going down the street as opposed to laying, you know, I think we laid 570 feet of track. So basically 600 feet of track. And then uh, Jamie Franta and I, you know, we laid down 570 feet of track. I wish I would have taken a picture of the truck when the, the truck rolled in with all the track because it was a stake bed full of truck, track, a stake bed full of cribbing. We laid it down and then we did it, I think did it 22 times. So we jogged next to a car pushing 
a Hustler 4, I think I had, and uh, with Robert Ellsworth riding it, and Jamie and I just chugging along next to a car. You know, I think uh, I think I did the math, and I probably could be wrong, but I think we ended up jogging like two and a half miles pushing the dollar that day. And, um, and of course, you know, I never made the movie, and uh, we ended up doing it somewhere else, something different. But hey. <laughs> If the director do what you have track, to do. You yeah, just do what you wants have track, to do. It's like, yeah, man, track. Yep. You know, track it is. If they want the they want the car, if they want to stay, go steady cam all the time, then be there with the Moses pole, or as Peter says, the bitch stick sometimes, and <laughs> have it standing by so they can unload it or take the camera off the guy. And I mean, that's our job. Mango was talking about it last week. If they're going handheld, when they get done with the shot, grab the camera, put it on your box, mm -hmm. do whatever. Our job is to facilitate camera movement and to be there for our operator, whether whatever the deal is. You know, you want to take you want to take the load off of him, which in turn takes the load off the assistant, which in turn you know we're just we're helpers, man. We're in the service department. You mm -hmm. grab the camera, you, you run with it, you do your thing, and uh, you know we're here to help out. Yeah. You know, if you help out enough, then if you help out enough, then somebody calls you back up and says, "Hey, man, you want to help out again?" Yeah. So. Yeah. Great answer. Yeah, I've always, uh, for dolly grips, I've always, since early on, I'll, my priority is the operator, him or her. They're the ones that's got to mm -hmm. wind themselves around the arm or however. So I try to, you know, make them, yeah. make it easier for them. Somebody, else, you know, the key grip or somebody, I say, you're going to pull this or push it. I'll say, well, it's easy for her if, the, you know, if she's over the dolly yeah. or he's over the dolly and we, you know, then, then they're not hanging off the end of the dolly thing. I don't care if I pull or push. So if I'm able to do it, you know, and it doesn't matter right. for the shot, go for what makes the operator most comfortable. And not, you can't go wrong, really, if you do that. Right. And that's where, like now, more than more than before, the hot gears or the um, the Ronin or the different pieces of equipment come into, come into play. And I don't know, but I'm just assuming that when we get back to work, there's going to be a lot more uh, remote heads on the dolly. And uh, so... I know there's a couple operators. Sometimes, you know, Peter would, would have a shot and as opposed to starting way up high and coming down low and being all wrapped around the arm and that kind of stuff, it's like, dude, why don't you just throw the hot wheels on? And, uh, you know, that way you can just sit there and be comfortable and, yeah. and uh, you know, mm -hmm. do the shot. Mm -hmm. But There I were a couple that, of questions actually I noticed um, yeah. on that PDF file about people asking coming back to work, is this going to mean that we're going to be on the remote heads? more and i mean the real answer is nobody really knows because no. we don't we don't know yes. what will happen yeah. and I, i'm speaking only for myself here but as an operator i do far better work on the dolly than i do off the dolly mm -hmm. um, there's many reasons for that one one reason is you feel the dolly moving underneath you so you instinctively know when you're back panning or when a move is coming um, how to end the pan with the dolly because you're on it but um the other reason, and it's, and it's just as important, and this is important for dolly grips, I think, to understand, is that I was talking earlier about, well, Brad actually raised it, about seeing outside the frame, about seeing the mic pack, the, 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 the coffee cup, you know, the, the, all the million things that normally an operator is pulling and, and checking for on every shot. Well, if the operator's distant from the set, I'm not going to see outside the frame lines. So the only person really who's watching that is going to be the dolly grip. So it True. puts a lot more pressure and responsibility um, that, you know, many people do it anyway. Guys like Brad and Mango and you know, Jack Glenn, you guys do it all the time. You don't think about it. But, but for someone who's not as experienced and are just worried about their thing, the dolly and the shot, and they're not seeing outside the frame, super important maybe to start thinking about that now. Mm -hmm. If we're heading in that direction, um, that uh, more responsibilities are going to fall on, on your back. Yeah. 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 You should as a as a dolly grip, you should police the set for the operator anyway. Look for reflections. Look for Absolutely. Them. Totally. That's totally. Part of your yeah, you're always you're always watching out for them. You yeah, know, which, is this is, you know. Yeah, because, which we, we haven't talked about in, in this meeting, but I think that's a, a valid point that No. Yeah, because I mean, realistically, um, you got nothing else to do, man. You're standing there behind a dolly watching the shot get set up and everybody's running around doing stuff. And you know what the frame is, you know where you're going to be, and all of a sudden they bring a light in that's you know just touching the frame. Then you either talk to your operator or you talk to the gaffer and say, "Hey, can you give me four inches on that thing?" You know, what I mean, I've had them jam twelve by twelves right up, you know, the side of the arm. I was on a thirty-five foot techno, jamming up right next to the thing with about four inches of room, and I 
told the gaffer, I said, bro, I said, Buck, John Buck, the uh, rest in peace, a great gaffer. But I'm like, Buck, you're killing me, dude. I go, she's in a boat, bro, in the water. I go, I'm following her around in the water on a boat and you're hemming me in. And he's like, Brad, I, I got a lighter. I go, well, I understand that, John, but I'm going to be pinballing off these twelve by here. And, you know, I mean, if you don't mind, if I bash him out of the way, we're good to go. <laughs> but, um, you know, can you give me a little bit of room? And then, you know, we can try and live with each other. And uh, so, and it, it falls back with, I think Mango talked about it, with using a monitor. Guys, whether they use a monitor or not. I have a monitor. I don't really use the monitor that much. Um, I started out. When I was doing it, it's more of a gun sight where you're looking over the operator's shoulder. So you, you learned your lenses. You know, you, I'd take a peek in the eyepiece when you put the lenses up and I'd see what the frame lines look like, you know, where they're going to be on which lens. And so I learned how to just gun sight everything. So looking straight over the guy's shoulder. And then with the advent of monitors, a lot of, a lot of people, I shouldn't say a lot of people, but I've noticed some people have a, a clamp back on the handle and the monitor is back there by them. So they're looking down at the, they got the handles They're looking down at their monitor and they're watching the shot. Well, for me, I can't do that. I have to look up past everybody. And if I want to use a monitor because everybody uses a monitor now to operate through most of the guys, or there's always one on the camera, I'll just go up there and tweak it a little bit, you know, or tweak it, get a little, just take a little bite, you know, so you can see a little piece if you need to. And then, that way you're not looking down like this and rolling off the end of the track because it's always, you know, it's a little embarrassing to roll off the track during the shot or to bash into something or, or if you're on a crane and you're focused on the monitor too much and you're swinging the arm and looking at a laser point on the ground to hit that mark. In reality, the arm's 50 feet out there and somebody decides to stop or stand up and you're going to, you know, you're going to peel somebody. So for me, my advice is to always watch the camera on an arm, wherever you're at, always, you know, look past the camera at what the actor's doing and adjust accordingly with that. I mean, uh, that's how I've done it. I'm not saying it works Guys, this is works super, super great advice for all the young Dolly Grips out there. That what, what Brad just said, if you're going to carry away one thing from this session, I want you to carry away that because I young dolly grips show up all the time with their monitor which they treat with velour bags and it's their precious thing and and they and they, and they look at it all the, and, and trust me if you see it on the monitor you've missed it if something happens and you need to correct yeah, by the time you see it on the monitor it's over you you can't correct it's done so the only way to do it right is the way guys like brad and mango do it which is to watch the actors understand where the where the camera is, understand what lens he's on. So, you know, you understand basically what the field of view is. And then you'll know, you'll look down and you'll see that the actor isn't going to hit his mark. He's going to be a little bit left of his mark. So you know what to do. Even before the dolly has stopped moving, you know that if you go to your mark, the shot's not going to work. So now you just gently make it work because you can anticipate it. It, it takes away your ability. The monitor takes away your ability to anticipate it. There was a great shot that, um, um, that Mango and Mitch had in the last session. I don't know if you guys remember it, but it was at Munich. And it was yeah. this, this dolly move where Mango and w was just kind of moving in with someone rapidly. And then they stopped in a two shot. It was a deep three because there was a man, a woman, and there was a guy in the deep background, Eric Ban, I think. Anyway, but, but it was beautiful. Like, it was so perfectly yeah. framed. The two of them were there. Banna was right in the middle. But how can you do that on a monitor? Because if you get in there on a monitor and it doesn't work, you got to change it. You got to move. Mango wasn't looking at a monitor. He was looking at the guys. He was looking at when they're going. He was looking at when they're stopping. So he stops with them. So it, it's mm -hmm. super critical. The monitor's there as a tool and you can use it for certain things, but relying on it on a shot by shot basis, it's not going to make you a better dolly grip. It's going to hurt you in the end. Yeah. Thank you, Peter. Yeah. It'll bite you sometimes. Yeah. It'll bite you sometime. It's a good tool, you know, on overs, you know, when you really got to do whatever. But, um, you know, it's, I, I'm not a big correction guy either. You know, I mean, it, I'll, I'll take a little heat and, you know, if somebody stacks up a little bit, I'll let them get stacked for a minute and, and then let the yeah. actor kind of play it out as opposed to just immediately 
moving the dolly real quick. Overcorrecting. Overcorrecting. Yeah. Yeah. It comes and from TV for some reason. It comes from TV where they're just constantly, constantly, you feel the dolly moving constantly. It's just trying to maintain that frame. Yeah. You just got to hold your balls tight sometimes and just yeah. let it play <laughs> out. Or whatever yeah. you got. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> let, <laughs> them, let it play out in, within yeah. the frame. You're not, not going to be that play far the off. Frame, you know, exactly. Exactly. So a masking for a moment, a masking for a moment, and then he opens up, doesn't deserve a correction because it's happening organically. But if he masks, you move, and then he opens up, now the frame's really spread, you regret it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right. Sean, uh, what do you think next? That, that's, uh, that's really great advice. Uh, I'm, I'm really glad that, that you guys got into that because I couldn't agree with you more. Um, there's, sev there's several technical questions, but I kind of want to end this on more of a, an artistic note. Uh, filmmaking note. Um, next week we're going to do a a vendor slash manufacturer meeting. We can get into like the the mechanics of dollies and lane dolly track and stuff like that. But Nathan Davis, who I'm going to uh, unmute, um, asks, "What is the biggest differences?" on work uh, what is it what are, what are the biggest differences in working on set on marvel films versus david fincher films which i kind of interpret as what is the difference between like action and narrative but i'll let you you um clarify that nathan if you want that's a pretty fair assessment i guess also what i was getting at you know there's a famous martin scorsese comment earlier about you know criticism of Marvel films not being very cinematic or stuff like that. So I was wondering from uh, the Dolly Grip and Kemop perspective, like what, what are you guys inside having worked on a David Venture film and Marvel films? Like what, how do you feel about those comments related to, or how do you describe the differences between those approaches? Well, uh, Brad, let me, I'll, I'm, I'm happy to take this uh, first. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, I, well, first of all, that, that question can be the same as like every, every movie's different. Every dynamic is different. Even within the Marvel universe, you're going to be working with different directors who like to work in different ways. But I think what your question is more in a general sense. By the way, I reacted really negatively to that comment by Scorsese. Uh, but anyway, that's a whole other, that's a whole other story. But I, I, think, I think you as a, as a dolly grip or a camera operator need to read the room and understand um, not only the style of the director, but somehow the style of the genre. That's what you're getting at, right? And, and does the, genre, the style of the genre drive the decisions that we make? The answer to that is yes. Because um, if it's a Marvel movie with Peyton Reed, for example, you know, I know how Peyton shoots. I know he's gonna be on the Steadicam for Masters. I know he's gonna be on uh, Dolly on track for close-ups and developing shots and stuff like that. And, and uh, so you start, you start thinking in those terms, you watch a blocking and you go, okay, I can see where this is going. You know, we're probably gonna come in here and probably twirl around like this and see how the windows are gonna sit down and that'll probably be a cut. So you, you, you begin to understand, you know, the, 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 the patterns that emerge within, you know, a certain director on a certain genre. And then you reach for those tools, you know, on a regular basis. Fincher, you know, as Brad and I pointed out, you know, he likes to be on track. He sets his shots up very, very uh, specifically. Um, there are a lot of developing shots that, that have to be worked out. So, uh, and you know, when you're going into it, that that's kind of the, that's gonna be the, that's gonna, in that genre, a, a Fincher directed drama, then, then that's what he's gonna reach for. He tends to use a lot of the same shots over and over, they all do. So, so I think the, 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 I think the choice is driven more by the director than the genre, but, but mm. overall, yeah, there is a certain kind of um, look and tool that you would use on, a, on an action movie that you wouldn't necessarily reach for uh, on Gone Girl or something like that. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that does. I guess a little Brad, bit you more. you want to answer that? Yeah, go ahead. You want to add to that, Brad? Yeah. Um, it just, you know, Marvel, first off, when you walk into a set at Marvel, you know, it's, everything's wrapped in blue or green or whatever. There's maybe a rock or, a, you know, a half of a wall or something. The rest of it's all just blue. So it's super exciting, but it's also like, you kidding me. So here we are. Everything's blue. I got to come down on the rock. And then, so the what I prefer I shouldn't say prefer what um, because I prefer working. So, but if you go in on a Fincher movie, 
and you're in a practical set or you're in a set that they built or it's just more fun it's more challenging to work in the real world than it is to work in the marvel universe and i don't want it to sound like i'm poo-pooing that stuff because i've done some marvel stuff we're working on marvel stuff right now i love it i like the people i like the i like the drill that they have with the 10 hours i like all that kind of stuff there's a lot of good about it but you also you know you kind of like out there in, in limbo you're out there in, in no man's land and, and you know they show you a preview you know the playlist so you look at it and you kind of say okay well i can't really go over there because there's a gigantic mountain right there or there's something else that you don't know about where in the real world you know you can work around or work with uh everything that's at hand because you can see it so it's you know i like it better i guess that's helpful thank you yeah yeah I think I think something you're going to see more and more of is what we had on the Mandalorian, the the Star Wars spinoff, which is I don't know how many of you know about this thing called the Volume, which is a basically a, a room with you know floor to ceiling LCD screens on the ceiling as well, um, and all the effects are pre-rendered and play back in real time on these LCD screens, and what makes it different is that on the camera, regardless if we're handheld or on the dolly or on the steady cam, there's a sensor. We called it the Sputnik because it has all these little things coming off of it. And it, it now knows the angle, the tilt, and the focal length, of course, is already dialed in, and the height from the ground. And, and what, what the sensor is telling the, the guys controlling the volume, which stands for volumetrics, what, what the sensor is doing is, when you look at the volume, it's like low res, you know, it's kind of pixelated, you know, because you can imagine the size of these screens. However, what it does is it throws a square box directly where the camera's looking. It's called a frustrum. And that box is high resolution. And it moves with me every time I move the camera. If I rest the camera and put my camera on my shoulder, that box is now up on the sky. And now we have high definition clouds, which we're not shooting, of course. But then when you bring it back down, so and not only that, it'll also do perspective. So let's say we're doing a boom up, you know, like this, and you're doing a boom up, and this is not practical. This is on the this is on the the wall. It will you will see over the top of that object because they have all the data of what's behind everything. So as the camera, I don't know if I'm explaining this well enough, but yeah. but basically the camera is linked to the background in a 3D environment, so that everywhere you turn, everywhere you pan. Um, this this box follows you and gives you your background rendering in real time. So what they see on the video and what you see in your viewfinder on your on your monitors is the final product. It's done. There is no green screen. And I believe that is the future. I think they're all building them now. You know, Sony I hear is building one. There's one going up in Australia. Um, Ten years from now, I don't even think it's going to take that long. Five years from now green screen will be out everything we shoot is going to be on these volumetric stages that's my anticipation of it because the technology is just in its infancy right now so you know, it was a little glitchy sometimes it's hard to do two cameras like as you can imagine because you can't really throw two frustrums out so there are, there are limitations to it but what what the results are tremendous and what it gives is it gives the actor the action you know the actor turns around and there's godzilla you don't have a little red mark up on the green screen that says that's Godzilla up there. Shoot your laser at him. Well, there he is. You know what I mean? So, so the the actors now can have that. The DP can use it on on Mandalorian. It was hugely successful because the lead actor, his costume was all reflective metal. So, if we were using a green screen, they would be spending bags of money just doing green suppression on all the reflections and then replacing them. Whereas here. Everything's practical. All the background's practical, and the DP's lighting with it. Instead of putting a, a 60 by 40 black, he's just going to, on an iPad, a guy's going to stand beside him. You want a solid over there? Boom, 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 boom. And that whole side of the wall becomes black. So mm -hmm. the, the volume is, I think, the future of where this is going. It's going to pop up more and more and more, and it's going to get better and better. But um, eventually, that'll get around what you're talking, at, talking about, Brad, which is showing up on stage, and all you've got is a green screen and a rock. So um, you know, the, the, the volume is going to give you the background. I Initially, I was hesitant about it, and I thought, oh, this is going to be a drag. 
but it wasn't a drag. It was real and it was great. And I used it. I used it all the time, you know, in framing choices. You come around a corner and the, and the move is dynamic and I can see like these three beautiful windows in the background with something in the foreground and I just make a beautiful frame because I see it. It's there. I can compose it on the fly. Whereas if it's green screen, you don't know what's going to, you don't know what's going to, you know, be back there. So how do you, how much lead do you give on the actor? How much excess negative space do you put on him? It's hard to know because you don't know what's going in there. So on, on, a, on, a, on a volume, you see it all. So that, that there, sorry for digressing, but that there oh, I think is going to be the future of this business. Good to know. Does that make it so that you can, you're not framing as con conservatively, right? You're not just doing generic framing for green screen. You're actually doing framing things how you would frame them in the real world. You, you see the background in real time, high definition rendered for your lens, exactly at the, if it's a 2-4-0 aspect ratio, it's a 2-4-0 frustrum that, that moves with you. And in that high definition window, you see everything. You, you, it's almost as if you were standing on planet uh, you know, Tatooine. You know? You're standing on Tatooine and it's got three suns. So you line up the three suns and, oh, it's like a nice frame with those three suns. Um, it's hard to explain unless you stand on the stage and see it. But basically what it allows you to do as the camera operator, the cinematographer, and the dolly grip is that you can use the background as if it's practical. Because every move you make is translated to the rendering in real time. They use game engine software for this. And it's, uh, I mean, there are bugs from time to time. It gets buggy or maybe in a fast pan, the frustrum might lag behind. So we see off of it in a fast pan, but they fix that. They just make some, mm -hmm. tweak some buttons and we just go again. Mm -hmm. It's really exciting technology. I'm, I was really, really impressed with it. Cool. Cool. There you go. All right. Harold, do you have anything else? I really don't. Um, uh, thank, uh, thank you, Brad and Peter. Thank you so much. And all the ladies and gentlemen from all over the, all over the world. Thank you. Yeah. Hopefully, uh, it was helpful. Yeah. It was, um, I, I, again, I didn't get into a lot of the technical stuff, but there were, there's going to be another meeting next week. Uh, Joel Fox, Rob Fisher, Christine Hundergaard, uh, James Hammond, Rourke Bayon, Jeff Herbert and Bo Belenek. You guys all asked questions that will get passed up to next week. Um, I, I, I personally appreciate that perspective that you, you both gave today. Um, it's very interesting hearing the, the stories and how you feel about the future. You know, it's, as an, as an relatively older Dolly grip, I agree with all of it. I think that there's things for, for younger Dolly grips to learn, younger operators to learn. And there's also things for us to learn from them as well, uh, which I've, which I've experienced over the last couple of years. And I like the idea of us integrating our, our knowledge and our enth their enthusiasm and, and, and moving forward as filmmakers. But uh, I sincerely appreciate both of you taking your time today to come mm -hmm. be with us. Thank you, Daryl and Sean, for putting it together. Yeah, it's, a great, it's, a great, yeah. it's a great platform. You've done well with it. Thank you. Yeah. yeah just real quick for uh, the younger folks, just know that you know, hey, when I started, the guys that were old, which were younger than me at the time, they said, I'm glad I'm not coming in this business right now, kid, because, you know, it's not the same as it was. I wouldn't want to be coming here right now. Well, 43 years later, I'm not saying, I'm not really saying that, but it's the same kind of thing. You know what? The business is what it is. It's evolved over the years for me in different things. We've used different equipment. We've come around with, you know, there's, you know, we went from fixed arm cranes, now we have the techno crane, so it's another tool to use. And my, my advice or my suggestion is just try and, try and roll with the technology, you know, with the new thing that Peter's talking about. Become part of it, become familiar with it, roll with it, because it's, it's your new reality. It is what, it is what your filmmaking uh, career will be filled with. So embrace it and, and take it and, uh, you know, just adapt. Always try and, Always try and adapt to the situation because if you don't adapt to the situation, it's just going to roll right past you. And then all of a sudden, now you're looking at the, the caboose instead of being up in the in, in, you know, the front of the train. And you know what? Don't worry about it. You know the film industry has been around for a while. Hopefully, it's going to stay around for a while. And uh, you know, look forward to having a, a, a nice career and having a lot of fun and meeting a lot of good people. I mean, I'm a lot, I've 
been lucky enough to meet a lot of good people. And uh, so it's, uh, you know, it's fun. Just, uh, just hang in there and, and own it for what it is for you. You know, it, this is your time. Uh, if you run into, you know, I'm going to go ahead and say older guys, Moose, I'm going to lump you in there. Uh, dude, man, I'm going to lump you in there. Um, you know, Proud to have me. just, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I do. My, my thing just died on me, but I can hear you now. But I'm just saying, uh, you know, ask questions, man. Ask questions to these guys. And, and if you run into something, you got a question, ask somebody a question. I mean, that's what, you know, we're kind of here for that right now. This is, this will become our time to, uh, I want to say mentor and that stuff. But, you know, if you got a question, ask a question. We'll answer it, you know. So, good luck. Yeah. <laughs> Enjoy. Yes. Move forward. I think we should I'm end over. it on the wise words of Brad Ray. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank um, you, everybody. Once again, and hopefully we'll see at least some of you next, next Wednesday. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Be safe. Thanks, guys. Thanks I'm going to leave this open for a few minutes Take care. for wh whomever wants to talk. I'm gonna, I, myself, am going to go hang out with my 10-year-old daughter. Yeah, likewise. See you, Sean. <laughs> nice. Thank you, Sean. Well, I appreciate it. For me. Hey, Can I see you guys? Yeah. Yes. Thanks, um, Thanks, I asked a, a very silly, very random question yes. earlier. What color is the paint on the wall behind you? It's funny. <laughs> you know what? I got to ask my wife. She painted it, and I, and I, I don't, it's, I honestly okay. don't remember. It's a latte. <laughs> It's, it's, espresso, yeah. it's an espresso brown but it renders so beautifully oh, and right. i'm just trapped in my apartment with this ugly yellow wall and i want to paint so i'm blowing well, I, everybody's paint colors well I, well I thank you for the uh compliment um yeah it, i think it is an espresso so i'll ask my wife and i'll uh i'll have that answer next week hopefully Let's do it with a much. <laughs> it looks like a hershey bar wrapper on my on my screen uh, yeah, this lick it tell us what it tastes like yeah. <laughs> that had to be moose yeah now this this was my daughter's room but she's away out of college. she's somewhere else um well thank you guys ladies and gentlemen thank you so much for being with us i'm gonna go uh get thank, you tuning in. thank you thank you much and thank you all for doing this this has been thank incredible you, thank you You're thanks, welcome, Brad. thanks peter hey moose thanks daryl thanks sean hey moose hey Trent. guys Bye, y'all. Thank you, Camille. Yubi, catch you later. Miss you guys. Bye, See everybody. you later. Thanks.